Hi, I'm Nick at SideView, and this is a talk about SideView's Canary app being given as part of B-Sides SPL 2022. Thanks for coming to watch it. While I will be giving you a quick overview of what Canary is and how to create things with it, and what kinds of things you can create, it is not really a how-to video. Its purpose is more to convince you that Canary is not like any other UI framework that you've ever seen, or any other dashboarding framework that you've ever seen. First, a brief top line about it. Canary is an app for Splunk. It's available on Splunk Base. It runs on Splunk Cloud and Splunk Enterprise. It's existed for about 10 years, but only been generally available for about three. If you are an old Splunker and you used to use side view utils, you will find it pretty familiar. It is essentially a rebuilt copy. It runs very decoupled from Splunk. Uh, it does not depend on any of Splunk's UI systems at all. But it's a tool for building a massive range of dashboards as well as search tools that are not really dashboards at all. And to use it, you do not really need to know any JavaScript at all. If you're watching this because you're a Splunk admin or you're responsible for some Splunk things, you're in the right place. But if you're not either of those things, that's fine too. So let's get started. You need a dashboarding framework. This is a phrase that has been kicked around, so I'm going to use it. That is easy to use, super powerful, doesn't require knowing JavaScript, and is not batshit crazy. SimpleXML gave you three of these. SimpleXML is powerful. Maybe it's even very powerful. Is it super powerful? I'm saying no today, so we're moving on. First, though, a word about JavaScript. Um, if you've already been working with Splunk dashboards and paying attention to what Splunk has been doing on their UI systems for a while, you may well have gotten the impression that Splunk expects you to somehow learn JavaScript, or worse, it expected you to learn JavaScript last year, or it thinks you already did. JavaScript, by the way, kind of sucks. Uh, I already know it, and I've been building modular user interfaces and user interface systems in JavaScript for 20 years, and I can tell you, building user interfaces by hand coding them in JavaScript is a bad idea. It is a bad idea that has somehow come to seem normal. Anyway, enough preaching. Other frameworks that Splunk has released over the years have given other subsets of these. Simple XML extensions do require knowing JavaScript, and they are much, they make simple XML extremely powerful. Remember Django? Uh, obviously, if I went through every single permutation that Splunk has released as a UI system, there would be a lot of these. But uh, And then there's, of course, the new Splunk UI suit, the new React thing. Um, it requires knowing JavaScript and then learning React. Canary can give you, you saw where this was going, the first three. So let's take a look at it. This is a hello world view. It is so simple, it doesn't even have the normal default navigation bar. In Canary, those are actually modules too. If we look at this in the editor, it looks like this. What is the editor, you ask? Uh, the editor is a full-featured authoring tool that ships inside Canary itself. And if you've ever used the editor inside your utils, it's nearly identical on the interface, although it's technically a different piece of code. Let's add, oh wait, first, bottom right here, you can see this strange white panel is actually showing a preview of the view that we're looking at. This is the hello world view. This funny looking page, funny looking uh, frame with the two yellow boxes is a schematic view of the view. I'm going to briefly skip ahead and show you a different view. This schematic looks more complicated in other interfaces, but back in this hello world view, it is just one HTML module. I'm going to very quickly show you what it's sort of like to add things to a view in Canary. I'm going to add a search module. I'm going to paste in an index internal search just as a demo. I'm going to make it run over the last 24 hours. Hit return. There is now a search on the page. Search is really just a search. It doesn't actually do anything by itself. So we have to add something to render the results. I'm going to add a table module and I'm going to add that underneath this search here, below the search or in some cases, I'll say downstream from the search in the docs. I'm just going to leave all this set to the defaults. Lo and behold, there is now 
a table being rendered in here. Suffice it to say, I can take this table out using the remove mode. I can add a chart instead. I can add lots of things. How do I do lots of things? This opens up a huge amount of questions and I can answer them, but the docs themselves inside Canary do a much better job than I would here. If you want to learn how to link from view to view, there are docs about adding redirector modules underneath the table to make it redirect when you click on it. Uh, docs about how, how to add like a checkbox pull down module to your view. And each of the pages has a living example with working config against run anywhere examples. So that is about as how to as I'm going to get. Uh, let's pause here for a moment because the editor isn't the only way to do this. I'm going to briefly, even though we're probably going to lose some of you, I'm going to briefly show you what the XML looks like, the raw XML for the page. Bear in mind, you have no need to see this. If you know you're going to use the editor, just close your eyes for the next 30 seconds. It looks like this. You can see there's a view, a label. Here's the module that was there before we came here. Here is the search that we added in the table. And that's it. That's it. There's no more XML in this entire, this entire presentation. We'll never look at that again. But it's there. If your mind is a little broken like mine, you can just develop in those little files and you don't have to use the editor. Um, there's nothing you can do in the editor that you can't do in the raw XML files. And there's almost nothing you can do in the raw files that you can't do in the editor. Okay, back to wiring up modules. Adding drill down, adds a redirector. Uh, all these questions are answered in the docs. I'm skipping over them. Let's skip. Uh, oh, actually, first, uh, not only can you go through by module or by key techniques, but to get, to get started, there is a sequence of links that will take you through kind of the first intro content into some intermediate content and get your feet wet. OK, let's skip ahead. I'm going to switch to a different view in the editor called example view, where you can see there's a little more going on here. Um, this is not a trivial view. There's a time picker, there's a search, there's a pager and a table, a progress indicator, various things. Now you may have noticed this is not crazy. These are neat interfaces, useful interfaces maybe. Uh, we are getting there. Now there are some modules in the Canary UI that themselves do surprising things. There is a rest module. Think of it like the search module, except instead of plugging tokens from form elements into a search, you're going to plug them into the arguments for posting to an arbitrary REST endpoint in Splunk. What REST endpoint? Uh, any REST endpoint. Uh, you can post to core Splunk EII endpoints to create a safe search or to edit a macro. If you have a custom endpoint as a part of some other app, like say to create a ServiceNow ticket, that is a fantastic example. I'm glad you brought it up. Any weird, tweaky, deployment-specific things you have are pretty good to, uh, candidates to consider for integration here. And again, you can just, there's no JavaScript involved to make it happen. You just wire things up. We'll come back to it. The multiplexer module. This is like the much bigger, much meaner sister of the trellis charts. And this will take every row in the search results. For each of those rows, it will clone out whatever arbitrary canary UI configuration you tell it to do. If you give it a header and a chart, then you will get a set of headers and charts. You can page it, so you can page, you can have your users page through charts. Okay, we'll come back to that too. The layer module, okay, if you use a layer, all it does is make all downstream modules render into a pop-up layer. Seems odd. Now, it's really the size of the resulting configuration space that runs away with the ball a little bit here. It is crazy how far you can get just by combining these off-the-shelf modules. Let's take an example. If you stick a layer under a table, and you stick some links in the layer, you put a redirector under each link, you have just made contextual action menus. You don't have to do any JavaScript or any CSS even to make this happen. They just appear. Let's see this in action. Here, this is actually our commercial product for Cisco Call Manager, and we're not going to talk about a lot of the stuff on the page. I just wanted to demonstrate these contextual action menus. These are, as I mentioned, there's a table, and then downstream from that is a layer. What does layer do? Layer puts everything downstream from it into a layer. Okay. Then there's four link modules, and each of them has other things under them. 
In this case, two of them go to other pages with redirector modules, and these two do other things. So instead of being stuck to a single drill down action, you can give your users multiple options easily with no JavaScript. There's also a number of other things on here. Uh, edit fields, you have a field picker, you have export controls, you have a full unnerfed set of UI construction things. So, all right, not quite crazy. Still kind of cool. Let's introduce, however, a weird notation for this. Um, search plus table plus layer plus link plus redirector. Ready? That equals contextual action menus. OK, we're going to do a little more of this syntax. What if we added more crazy? It's when we fold in that rest and multiplexer module and the layer, I suppose, that things start to get really odd. Here, I'm going to just show you the weird syntax, but then I'm going to shoot, uh, let's, let's just see it. Let's, let's just see it. This is crazy. Um, going to show you a multiplexer example. Here, there's a lot going on here, but I want you to focus on the fact that there are, that what is showing as the result is multiple charts. So these search results are themselves charts. In this case, it's, it's got a pager on it. It just happens to be showing less than 10 items, so the pager elements are not appearing. So this is a, something that is, is displaying suggested reports to an end user. And the user has picked the kilobyte field, and it's saying, all right, how about A, sum of kilobyte over time split by series, B, average of kilobyte over time split by series. It's just doing these suggestions. This really changes the game. For um, drill down, let me come back to PowerPoint for a moment. I'm sorry about that. To take an example, um, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to mock this up. Say you have a table of users, and you're interested in the sessions of these users. Maybe there's a thousand of them. And you want to sort this table. OK, this, this user is interesting. I want to click on this user. You click on it. Instead of just getting one table you can load underneath for your drill down detail, picture being able to page through every one of their sessions, where each of their sessions is represented as a little time chart. And each of those time charts representing one session has drill down on it for further exploration. That is a different way of thinking about drill down or even UI. And that is kind of what the multiplexer uh, really gets to give you. Here's another example that is a little more crazy. It multiplexes multiplexed multiplexers. I, I think that's insane. And it's sort of like we're recreating manager, kind of. Let's show, I'll show you. This may look familiar, these links on the left side, very close, they look like what's in the settings menu. This, by the way, is the Canary settings menu, which uses essentially this exact same system anyway. But we're not, this isn't statically rendered, this is a multiplexer chunking out this whole thing. Where do we get this from? We get this from Splunk's REST API. No one knows this, but Manager is itself a set of EII entities. What? No. Ow. Stop it. Okay, so this allows us to render, multiplex, and then render things. What things? Well, searches. Then we can make more REST command start calls to get the config. And then here we can list them all out. All right, I'm going to click it, and it's going to make a layer appear, echoing out the keys from that knowledge object. Could I have made a form here with form elements? Yes, certainly. Could I have used the output of that form into a REST command to post changes back to the search? Yes, absolutely. Did I have time to do that here for this talk? No, no, I did not. Uh, also, not everything on this page works, frankly. Uh, EAI and Manager are a sprawling thing, and um, it, each of these endpoints behaves a little strangely. It would take a lot of work to completely recreate Manager. I just did this because it was fun. OK. Keep on going through examples here. This is that Manager example, by the way. I just wanted to sort of to you, I'm not making this up. This takes a search that does just a big rest command, post process it to get the sections. What are sections? Sections are knowledge, system, distributed environment, users and authentication, etc. For each section, it's going to multiplex. This is the thing that chunks out 
Okay, it's going to create a chunk called for the, all the data stuff, and then a chunk for all the distributed environment stuff. HTML is just our little header. Post process will now carve out of the same search results a different uh, cross a different subset. We're going to get just the section equals knowledge. Multiplex those into a link. What? Holy cow! Okay, we're maybe getting crazy, but I don't know. It still seems like we're making useful things. Let's take a little shortcut into another useful thing. Uh, you can make little utility views all the time. Uh, this actually is one called the Fresh Maker. It just gets the list of debug refreshable entities and renders them as both a pulldown and then multiplexes them as links. So these are basically the same thing. You can click these and you'll get uh, those, those um, knowledge objects reloaded from disk. Uh, something came up in this uh, community Slack just, just recently where someone was asking for a way to programmatically hit a REST endpoint to do something strange to a whole lot of users at the same time. And this was, oddly enough, accomplishable in Multiplex just by making a quick little tool. So you can make yourself little presents to do things really quickly. It becomes a productivity tool for lots of weird little things. And this, this one, this is a little crazy. To show you, I'm actually going to switch to the editor so you can you can see what it's going to do before it does it. So this view begins with a text field and a button. The text field is called MSG, which here stands for message. Down here a bit is a rest module. The rest module is going to take our message and post it, of course, because that's what the rest module does here, message.raw value. It's going to prepend it with the current username of the username current logged in as well. Where are we going to post it to? We're going to post it to a funny little endpoint that ships in the side view editor. So we're kind of abusing the side view editor to add a module to a view. What view are we going to add the module to? Ourselves. We're going to add the thing to ourselves. Okay. We can do that. And then assuming that the rest command is successful, it's going to refresh the page. Okay. Is it going to have, uh, what if it's not? Oh, then it'll display some errors. Okay. Let's see it work. So it is test. Ta -da. There. I have made a goofy little chat interface. Well, I hope that you thought that was a little crazy, but we are going to step back from the brink a little bit and come back down to Earth, or maybe it's a crazy planet. We were orbiting crazy not long ago. Anyway, and talk about features you might actually use more in the day to day. Rest and multiplexer are fun, but you don't necessarily need them. Back button support. At least for me, that's always a top of mind concern. If I'm going to build something complicated, are my users going to be able to just use back button to go back? Yes, you can. You just have to look up the URL loader module and it's like two lines in your view. Tabs. Yes, you have tabs. If you've been suffering uh, by having no access to tabs to build things for your users, you don't have that problem anymore in Canary. You can think of tabs much like an odd little pull down module. It behaves essentially the same. Tabs, radio, pull down, checkbox, a bunch of them actually have pretty much the same kind of uh, signature API. Tabs are often combined with a switcher module, just for reference. OK, moving on. Checkbox pulldown. Unlike some other UI frameworks, yes, there is a checkbox pulldown. I don't understand how you can get by without a checkbox pulldown. It probably is the single most used control among all the form element modules. Search controls. You can yourself give your end users Job controls, export to CSV, print buttons, job inspector, all the stuff that the admins have. Last but not least, blue links, my personal favorite. Anyone from Splunk way back in the day may recall that 3.x had little blue links. 4.x even had little blue links. I think even 5.x, you had little links on your dashboard. You could you know, just give your users links to click on instead of tables to drill down on. Not everyone likes to click tables. How do you do it? You multiplex a link module. Now that your mind is broken, you know what that means. 
Is it free? For some reason, I want to say, is it secret? Is it safe? Yes, yes. Uh, is it, can I use it? Is it free? It's distributed under the side view free internal use license agreement. Okay, a bunch of you just ran away. No, it's free for internal use, meaning within your company, you can build views and apps and do whatever you want, uh, com composing you know modules together to make cool things. If you want to build an app for other companies, for other people to distribute outside of your company, you need to talk to us. If the thing you want to build is free, we'll probably just give you that agreement for free. If the thing you want to build is not free, we can do that too, but that's different. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. What do you need to do if you just want to do internal use and you want to build canary views right now, mess around? Well, of course you, you can, you can build them. I just kind of showed you a little bit and you can download canary today from Splunk base and go through the little tutorial it has in there. But, um, to actually make the app, your existing app redirect correctly between simple XML and the canary UI, UI and the search and report pages and the canary UI and manager in the canary UI, there's some hoop jumping you have to do that I tend to call nav scaffolding. There is a tool coming in the next release of canary that makes this boil down to just click a button. When you click that button, it goes, finds your app on disk and canarifies it by injecting this weird stuff into it. It is what it is. Uh, until then, feel free to ask me for help. Info at sideviewapps.com or nick at sideviewapps.com. My name is Nick Mealy. Uh, if you are on the Splunk community Slack, I am mad scientist there. I hope you go build something fun. I hope you have lots of questions. To find out more information, go to sideviewapps.com slash apps slash canary. Where is Canary going? Uh, it's been around, as I sort of mentioned, since about 2012 and uh, GA since 2019. It can post things to arbitrary REST endpoints. It's largely decoupled from Splunk. I, I didn't really mention this, but Canary is uses absolutely zero of all Splunk UI systems. It is completely its own thing. It serves its own HTML from its own custom REST endpoint. It has no dependencies on Splunk UI systems. If Splunk broke absolutely every single thing and the next release, Canary would not notice, literally. So if you can do all that, you've come all that distance, can you post searches to systems that aren't even Splunk at all and render rows of key value pairs from those systems? Yes, ish, it's coming. Can it be run totally independently from Splunk? It will someday. And I'll leave you with that. Um, I hope that you have fun whatever you do next. And huge thanks to B-Sides, and I hope you enjoy watching other B-Sides talks that I'm going to be watching with you. Have a great day.